You guys hear me? Oh, yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Lucas, for those that don't know me. Um, I've been a member of this church for a couple of years now. Um, and I'll just give you a little background of my life. I'm currently married. I have a wonderful little big boy. Uh, his name is Raphael. Uh, you guys might have seen my wife a few times singing up here and maybe at the main church. Her name is Rachel. Uh, she looks like one of those Brazilian singers called Nivi Suárez. <laughs> people make fun of. <laughs> uh, she doesn't like that, but it's, I think it's hilarious. Um, so uh, a little bit more about me. I, I used to be an atheist. I, I talked about this a little bit briefly um, last week, I think. Um, and at, at around the age of 17, I, I started asking a lot of questions um, about what the purpose is of life and what the meaning of life is. Um, and I remember as an atheist debating with my parents about wanting to come to church. They wanted to take me. I hated it. I did not like it at all. I didn't want to hear the pastor. I didn't want to hear the, the worship. I didn't want to hear any of that. Um, and I remember even vividly having a conversation where I was like, well, I don't want to choose God's way. I don't want to choose the devil's way. I want to choose my way. Not knowing so much about the devil to then find out that I was still going to the devil's way. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I did a lot of soul searching, so to speak, um, and tried to study as many worldviews as I could, and the most convincing, uh, religion or the most convincing way of life that I, that I found was Christianity, was cr through Christ. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, what I really want to talk about today is about the attitude of your minds, uh, what you should be, how you should be looking at life. Um, and that goes for everything, every aspect of life. That could be either your job, that could be either uh, school right now, your friendships, your relationships, um, you know, college for some of you who are almost on the brink of, of, of going to that, um, to that part of your life, your family, things like that. Um, the passage that I want to read today is Ephesians 4 uh, from verses 17 through 24. Um, I don't know if you guys, if you guys have it over there. Not yet. There we go. Cool. Uh, so my version's a little bit different, um, but hopefully it will convey the same message. Um, so I'll just start from the 17, and I'll just give like a little bit of an explanation as I go. So, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. So I'll just stop that right there real quick. Um, I don't know if you guys know what Gentiles are, but that's just another fancy word of saying non-Jewish person. So that could be Greek, Roman, whatever, Brazilian, not Jewish. <laughs> um, so they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. So two things. Um, hardening of their hearts is sort of like going against God's will. Um, harden their, their hearts in the sense of rejecting the thing that he's, he's, he's teaching and he wants us to live out. Um, and ignorance is basically not having the knowledge of it, um, but it sort of goes hand in hand, both. So to continue on, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So... Um, this is the letter of Ephesians. Uh, if you guys don't know too much about it, it was written around maybe 60 to 61 AD uh, by the Apostle Paul. Um, if you guys don't know who the Apostle Paul is, he basically was a huge persecutor of the Christian faith. Um, he was responsible for a lot of the imprisonments of early Christians um, and their deaths too. Um, and his conversion was going to uh, a place called Damascus, and on the way there, he had a vision of Christ, and then he changed his whole life. His whole perception of, of reality changed, um, and he went to support a, not a, an additional God. He, he got a clear vision of who the true God was um, through Christ, and through then, he started being one of the most prolific writers of, of the Christian faith. Um, in that time, and he converted many people over to the cause. Um, but you have to think about that. It's interesting that a man who despised the people who he ended up being a part of changed his whole life around. 
um, even went in th- uh, through imprisonment. This letter that he r- was writing was, be- was maybe, historians say that was around the time that he was in jail. But it's interesting that the same man who threw people in jail for this way of thinking, for this way of life, ended up being the same person, ironically, that was then thrown in jail and eventually executed for his faith. Um, so what I want to talk about from this, the, the part that really stuck out to me um, from this passage was to be made new in the attitude of your minds. So my point here is that God wants all of us to be critical thinkers. Why is that? Well, we live in a society right now where a lot of things are taken at face value. Um, there's a lot of information out there, but there's equally a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of false truths, uh, a lot of relativism, a lot of uh, ideas that are out there that seem to be true, but they're really not, uh, that it looks really nice on like a or sticker or it looks really nice on the social media post or on one of your pictures or something like that. Um, but Christ calls us to be beyond that, for us to actually reflect on the things that we are listening to, reflect on the things that we are seeing, reflect and analyze the things that we think. Because right here, the attitude of your minds, the the things that you think about will drive your life moving on forward. And I know this is a bit of a morbid example, but take these mass shootings that have been happening for the last couple of years. I have a huge respect and um, love for the sanctity of life. So I can't bring myself to take another life. But these people that go on and commit these atrocities, there must be a little switch here of a, a deprivation of what they consider to be actually valuable in this world. And life is probably not it to go on and commit these atrocities. So I know that's a bit of an extreme example, But it's an example, nonetheless, of how you think will impact your life later on. So there's a lot of things that we have today in society where we just assume. Um, I remember when I was just getting engaged to my wife, um, and I used to work at UPS, and this this fellow that I used to work with, I told him that I was engaged. And he's like, whoa, you're engaged, bro? First of all, I was like 21, so I I know that scared him. But... um, he was like, but how do you know like, that she's the one? I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, the one, you know? Like, there's so many women out there, so many, so many fish in the ocean. How do you know she's the one? I was like, oh, well, that's easy, bro. Uh, there's no such thing <laughs> as the one. <laughs> um, there's no such thing at all. So I just love my wife. I don't want to be a- a- alone without her uh, for the rest of my life. I don't want to continue my life on looking back going, oh, what if I married my, my best friend? Because we were great friends for like a year and a half um, before we even started dating and anything like that. So, but you see, here in, when you reflect on it, it's interesting that this idea of the one that you need to find like the perfect person for you, whatever, put him in the hesitation because he himself was in a relationship for many more years than me. And he never made the commitment to get married to his wife up until that point. And he criticized me for it, gave me a little bit of stuff for it. Um, but it's interesting that he's been hesitant this whole time because he has this idea of the one. I had no such thing. And I don't believe in it. And I see no biblical basis for it. Uh, the Sadducees, oh, I, I believe it's the Sadducees, correct me if I'm wrong, or the Pharisees, um, one time wanted to, I think it was the Sadducees, they wanted to criticize Christ and sort of put denial in the existence of the afterlife. That there's going to be heaven, we're all going to, you know, be resurrected, all this other stuff. So they came up to him and said, hey, I got a riddle for you, Jesus. Answer this. One woman. Jesus is like, okay. One woman marries one guy. Cool. Guy dies. Okay. Then she marries another guy. Okay. Then she marries like five more guys because they all die afterwards. I don't know why they're dying so much, but they're all dead. Um, so when, she, when heaven comes, who she could be married with? And she's like, oh, no one. Because we're not given in marriage. We're going to be like angels in the sense that we're not going to get married. And there's going to be no marriage in heaven. There's only going to be one true marriage, and it's going to be with Christ and God and himself. But um, in terms of like the marriage that we see here in this life, there's none of that. So they were like, oh. 
well, never mind. But you see, this, they had this idea of, of that there's going to be marriage in heaven, and that completely blew them away and gave them doubt into the existence of the afterlife. But going back to my example, you know, and it's funny, after two weeks of that, that conversation that I had with this guy, he then gets engaged. So that was pretty funny. I was like, oh, what happened, bro? You found the one? You found the big fish? Oh, that, congratulations, my friend. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> um, but but that, that, that little story is just to illustrate again. See, ideas have consequences in your life. You have to really think about the ideas that you've been told, the ideas that you see out there in society. You need to reflect uh, and think how accurate is it because believe it or not even our education system sometimes and i've been and i've been through the public system here in in this in the state especially and you guys can agree with me a lot of the stuff that they teach us is like when am i ever going to use this um geometry like you're not going to see me like if i'm working at a grocery store you're not going to see me go like look at this apple i have to measure the geometrical shape of this other apple and then to put you don't need doing any of that obviously it depends on what you want to do if you want to be a mathematician and then you know obviously you need to learn math i mean how you can teach math if you're if you're dumb in it makes no sense to me um but you know, we're not all going to aspire to be that. So it's interesting that there's a lot of things that, like, you, you, as, you, as, as you grow older, you're like, really? Wait, what was the point in that? So it, it's things to reflect. I even remember when I was a kid, when I was, like, about maybe, like, six eight, uh, through eight, I had this idea in my head that teachers and I think adults were, like, all perfect in the sense, like, they couldn't, like, do anything wrong. And I remember, like, having a class with, with, uh, with my English teacher, and she said something wrong, and then the kid corrected her. And her reaction was, oh, yeah, no, you're right. I made a mistake. I was like, you made a mistake? You can do that? Oh, my God. <laughs> and then I, I, I left the class, and, I, and on the way back home uh, on the bus, I was like, oh, my God. Is all teachers this inaccurate? Or did they all make mistakes like this? Well, what about adults? So should I take everything that an adult says as like 100% accurate? No. Obviously not after that example. Then I started doubting things. But not, not to the point where I was like super disobedient and just like hated adults, period, and try to give them, you know, a horrible life when I was around. But, you know, when they said something, I was like, uh-huh, okay. I don't know if that's like 100% true, but, you know, I respect your opinion. That was sort of like my reaction towards it. Um, so... God wants us to be critical thinkers. He wants us to reflect on the things that we currently believe, because believe it or not, we have a lot of ideas in our heads that are constructed by society. You develop it uh, through, your, you know, through school, through your friends, or whatever, through your parents, and they may not be 100% accurate. So what's the, the question is, so where do you get those ideas and try to compare them to see what actually is true? And this is my first point. The first point is, and this is a very basic thing, but unfortunately we, despite us having all the access to it, more than previous generations before us, we seem to be the most illiterate in it, which is the Bible. Um, we need to pick the Bible as our source of truth to compare these ideas that we've been taught, these ideas that we listen to out there, um, and honestly make a judgment call on what the Bible is teaching about it so that we can apply it in our minds and then we can live it out and glorify God in it and also bless others around us. So first point, pick the Bible as your source of truth. And we talk about the visible church and the invisible church. I don't, I'll never know and nobody here will ever know who actually here is a true Christian um, and who is not. For, for those of you that might not be Christian, might not hold to the faith, um, as others, I want to genuinely, I want you to genuinely reflect about what your source of truth is. Because if it's not the Bible, and if it's not any other religious book, then what is it? Especially if you're an atheist. And this is a question that I asked myself when I was younger, around the age of 16, 17. Where am I going to compare this moral, this moral landscape that we live in? Where is the source of truth? Like I talked about last time. Everybody says one thing about a position, um, about how you can support, like I said last time, about you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. How can you support it? 
And then some people say, oh, you got to also support homosexuality and transgenderism. And then other people say, no, you don't. And it's like, okay, well, who's telling the truth? Who's right? No one knows. Right? Because they don't have a moral absolute truth. We've taken and eliminated the Bible out of all the public schools. We don't have a moral, cen- a moral center of truth. Not anymore. In terms of like the public school. We still do because we're Christian. <laughs> but everybody else, not so much. It's really relative. So pick the Bible as your source of truth. Second thing, be skeptical and ask questions. Not in the sense of throw everything that you've are currently, you know, no, and just out the window. Just don't throw it out just like that. But for things that you may have a little bit of doubt about, ask questions. Investigate. Look into it. Look at the Bible. See what it says about it. If it doesn't say much, unfortunately, we're not always going to have all the answers to our questions. But ask anyway. It's really good. And I love that we're doing this after every sermon here. You need to ask questions so you, that you can develop your minds so that you can think more like Christ. You need to be like that. It's, it's a good thing. Don't think it's a bad thing. It's a wonderful thing. It breaks us out of this mold that society probably puts us in. Um, and we can be out, outside of it and bless others with the knowledge, the true knowledge that we have about Christ, about humanity, about civilization, how it should be, how it should live, how we should teach, how we should, I don't know, listen to music, marriage, all these wonderful things. So be skeptical and ask questions about it. And third, and very pretty much straightforward, apply the ideas and compare them to the Bible. Compare what they teach about it. It's a bit redundant, but seriously, apply those ideas to see what you get. Because believe it or not, you're going to be very surprised on a lot of things that you find out about that we've been taught as, you know, since as kids, that's not true. And there's ideas out there that are being promoted, that are being very... Uh, mainstream ideas that seem that it's very good and, and, and it's very, um, how do you say, um, attractive to, to the ears, but it turns out to be nothing. There's that, even that saying, not all that glitters is gold, right? It doesn't appear as it seems. It seems like it's a good thing, but it's really not. So, um, yeah, that's really what I w- wanted, wanted to talk about, actually, so. <laughs> I, um, I hope you guys took some notes. I was there taking notes. I had to. This is so good. Thank you so much, bro. Yeah. I appreciate it. And, and now, guys, you're going to get to hear a testimony um, from Lorena, from, who's right there already. And then um, the three of us will be up here to answer some of your questions. We have a couple questions that we didn't get to answer last week. So we're going to start with those. Yep. Some really good questions. And then after that, you will be able to ask your questions as well. And remember what he said. God wants you to be a critical thinker. He doesn't want you to just go about life. I mean, this is one of the things that I try to push you guys to do here. Ask why. Why do, we, why do you come to church? Why do we sing songs on a Sunday morning? Why do we read a text from this book? Yeah. Why do we close our eyes to pray? Have you guys thought about it? Why close our eyes? Do you think God's not going to hear you if your eyes are open? Why do we put the milk in the bowl and then eat it up. before the cereal? I have. That plenty, is a great question. I have plenty of reasons. <laughs> or the microwave part. The microwave. You need Jesus for it. But the other <laughs> Anyway, Lorena, can, can, you, can, you guys, can you guys do me a favor? Can you guys put your hands together for Lucas one more time? Put your hands together for him as a way of thanking him. For your word, thank you so much. Lorena, share some more knowledge with us. Hello? Oh, jeez. Hi, everyone. If you don't know me already, my name is Lorena. If you've heard my name but you didn't know who I was, it might be because that kid back there is my sister. And if that's not the reason, well then I'm sorry about whatever you heard. I'm going to tell a story today, and it's a very true story. And it's written in the form of a letter to my younger self. 
And before I start, I would like to place an official trigger warning because I respect you all that much. Um, I will be talking about anxiety and depression and I will be talking about suicide. Um, and so before I start, I want us to all bow our heads and close our eyes and take a moment in prayer. And if you feel like these triggers are not something that you can listen to and deal with right now, I encourage you to step out to our hallway area in the back and just hang out until it's time for questions. Um, after all, we don't, we don't want to trigger anyone in a way that is uncomfortable. If you feel like you can stay, I highly encourage it. Um, not because I have anything fantastic to say, but because I think God is really moving in this place. Um, so let's just have a quick prayer. And like I said, if you want to slip out unnoticed, um, you are totally welcome to do that. All right. Everyone bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. Lord Jesus, I praise your holy name because I can, and I thank you for that. I thank you that we are given the opportunity to be in your presence, to be so close to you, God. I thank you because you are in this place constantly, because you are always with us, even when things get dark, even when things get confusing, when we have doubts and questions, when we're uncertain of ourselves and of the world. I thank you that you are a constant, that you are a certainty that we can have. And I ask, Lord, that you may be in this place beyond today, that you may be in our lives beyond today, and that you may bless lives in this room today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Dear younger self, hi. I'd ask how you're doing, but I know it's not good. I'd ask what day it is, but I know it by heart. Christmas of 2017. I'd ask if you like that new house that you and the family just moved to, but I know you hate it. And I know that you're 19 right now, a sophomore in college. I know you just failed some classes. I know that depression and anxiety diagnosis that you got four years ago has grown a bit out of control. I know you haven't been going to therapy Dear younger self, I know you're isolated, that you've isolated yourself. I know you haven't been to Access or out with your friends in a long time. I know you feel like no one has noticed your absence, and I know you feel like no one sees that you're not okay. I know you feel unheard and unloved. Younger self, I know right now you feel hopeless and helpless. I know right now you feel numb. I know you feel nothing and everything at the same time. I know that just as soon as the cold, blank depression kicks in, you're suddenly consumed by fear of failure, by that feeling of anxiety over everything you do and even what you haven't done yet. I know you've held something sharp in your hand and consider tearing it yourself. I know you've looked at those pills and considered just downing the whole thing. I know at this moment you're sitting in dad's car and I know that you just had a fight with mom and dad because it feels like screaming is the only way anyone will hear you. I know right now you're contemplating swerving off the highway at 80 miles an hour just to end it all. But I also know something that you don't. See, I'm 22 now, and a lot has changed. I know that you come out of that deep, dark place, and I know you'll be okay. I know that you grow into yourself and discover beautiful parts of yourself you didn't even know. I know you meet people and learn things that are incredible and interesting and fun. I know that because you make it past this day, God will carry you through challenges and victories, through beautiful sunsets and gorgeous mountains. And I know that you make it through that day because you have Jesus. I know you're not dead because God's not done with you. I know you find friendships that strengthen your love for God. I know you experience love and heartbreak and every other beautiful thing life has to offer you. And I know you see all this 
because you make it past that day. Because Jesus loving you is a good reason to stay alive today and tomorrow and always. Younger self, I know nothing feels easy or simple right now. But one thing is, and always stays simple, Jesus loves you. Jesus sees you. Jesus hears every cry and is with you even in that deep darkness. And Jesus wants you to stay alive because he has so much in store for you. Because he has a plan and a purpose far more perfect than your understanding. And because he started a good work in you. And he who began a good work shall carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Lord, thank you so much for sharing this with us. And I, it always gets to me. Um, yesterday, someone asked me if I knew this when you were going through this. Um, and I said, not the beginning, right? Because as you mentioned in the beginning of your story, for a period of time, you were shut down, right? You were closed off to the world. Um, we didn't know what was going on. But then you, but then you saw help. And you, you, I, I love the connection between the two messages. Right? You, you changed your thinking. And because you changed how you thought, your life also changed. And that's, that's, if you look in the Bible, in the New Testament, that's the idea of repentance. It's the, you change how you think. Because how you think impacts how you live. You live the way you live because you think the way you think. Right? You come to church the way you do because you think the way you think. You sit the way you, you sit in church. You clap or not clap. You worship the way you do because of how you think about worship. You go on living because of how you think. And a lot of times because of God's grace too. <laughs> As you mentioned, God was not done with you. There's a song that says that. God's not done with you. We're going to sing it soon. Um, in, the, in the following weeks. But if you want, just go ahead and start listening to it. It's a beautiful song. And now I want to give you guys the opportunity to ask questions. I don't know how much time we'll have because today there's also the vaccine clinic going on downstairs, and that's happening from 10 to 11. So, but we want to answer at least the questions from last week and at least a couple of your questions from today. So, Fabi, if you could put the link on, it's already on the screen. So you can go to that link right there. We get nothing. If you're new here, we don't get a phone number. We don't get an email. We don't even get a name, nothing. All we get is your question, and we'll try to answer them here as honestly and as truthfully as we can because some questions uh, might be just, hey, that's a very, very deep question, and we might have to really think about it, pray about it. But most of your questions, we've asked them ourselves. Um, three different perspectives here. We've gone through so much in different ways, the three of us. Um, and we want to be able to help you guys with your questions. All right, so go to the link and ask us um, the questions you may have and maybe some questions that came up as Lorena was talking here. Maybe you identified with some of the stuff she, sh she shared and you're like, how do I deal with my pain? How do I deal with the thoughts that I'm having? How do I change my mind? Because I just feel like this is the right thing to feel. This is the right thing to say. This is the right thing to think and do. How do I change if I'm convinced that I'm right, for example? Um, and I'm going to go grab my computer in the back because I have the questions from last week on it. But we'll be getting the questions from today here on the iPad. So you guys can start sending them. Um, but I do want to start with a question to you two before we get their questions. Um, Lucas, when you, when you started to talk about ideas, right, and asking good questions, uh, can you give us an example of a good question and a bad question? Maybe, to make it clear, a good question and a dishonest question, because sometimes we don't want an answer. 
Do you know what I'm talking about? I think I do, yeah. Okay. Can you give, just so we can think, like, that's a good question to ask, or maybe that's, that's just a silly question. You're just going to go around and around with that, like the rock being too big that God can't. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think so. Can God create a rock too big that oh. he can't? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, can, can you give us an example of a good question? Would you think, like, this is a good question to ask. If you have it, ask it. Think about it. Go search for answers for it. Yeah. Um, and then give them an example of a bad question. Uh, can you do that? Yeah. Sweet. I, I think I'll steal that one that you actually said because I can't think of another one. Um, so the, uh, a bad question would be, can God create a stone bigger than he can carry? Um, really bad question. Um, I understand what the intention is behind it. It's just to try to disprove God um, a little bit. Um, and try to sort of cast doubt into who he is. Um, so not a good question at all. Um, the, a, a good question will probably be how... This is, this is a good question you asked me, Matt. Oh, my God. Um, a good question would be how do we know that the Bible is true? Or how can we have confidence in the accuracy of the Bible? I think that would be a good question. Because it's not loaded. You're not trying to criticize or sort of demean the Christian faith. You're genuinely wanting to know whether or not it's true. Um, and I think that's valuable. That, that's something if you, that's a, that's a mature question to ask because you genuinely want to know. And the answer might not be convincing or it might be, uh, depending on how you stand with it. But... Uh, that, that would be two questions, I think. That would be one good, one bad. Yeah. All right, so we're going to start with the questions that we didn't get to answer last week. Um, the first one was, I saw a show when I was younger um, where a little girl who believed in God was trying to convince an old man to believe in God. And so he asked her, if God loves us, why does he let bad things happen? Her, answers, her answer was to show us what love and good things are. What would you, what would you answer? So the guy, this little girl is trying to say to uh, convince this guy that there is a God, but his question is, well, if God exists and you, you're saying he loves us, why does he let bad things happen? What would your answer be to this guy? I have a love-hate relationship with this question. Um, we spent a lot of time studying this question in my theology class in college. Um, and a big part of it is bad things happen to us because we as humans allowed that to happen. With the occurrence of the original sin from Adam and Eve, that opened up space for bad things to happen. Um, and that opened up space for sin to occupy our world. Um, that's why Paul tells us that we are all born with sin. We all exist as sinners. And we need Jesus to do anything, <laughs> to survive another day. We need Jesus. Um, so I think there's a lot of different directions we can go with this question of, oh, well, it's human's fault that bad things happen. Oh, well, because, you know, this, this, and that. I think the simplest answer is we need to be dependent on God. And if we only have good things happening, I think that limits how much we search for God. Um, especially because I think we have often a vending machine relationship with God where we only go to him when we need something. And we need... We need that balance of good things happening to inspire gratitude and to remind us that good things can happen yeah. and bad things happening to remind us that God is with us even in those dark times. And also that, that this is not how it's supposed to be, right? Bad things remind us that this is not how things were meant to be, right? This is not it. Because of sin and brokenness and Satan, Right? This world is experienced by us, not how it's going to be when Jesus comes back and puts everything right. right? This is wrong. Why do I have chemical imbalance in my brain? Why do I feel depression? 
Why do I feel anxiety? Why do I feel sadness? Why do I, why did, why is my mom? Just last night she texted me again. She's like, I couldn't sleep the whole night. I had pain, so much pain. I might have to go to the hospital. Today. Why? Why do so many bad things happen? Because this is not how things are meant to be. Now, there is a place where we're going to. There is a place where this God who created all things and came and died on a cross to make a possible way for that universe to be a reality for all of us who don't deserve to be there but will be there because of his grace, um, that will happen one day. That world will come. That existence will happen. Um, a, a question for you, Lucas. How would you approach telling a non-Christian about church? How would you approach a non uh, telling a non-Christian about church? Just like church in general? Church in general. That's the, I think the question is, how do I approach a non-Christian? I try to convince a non-Christian to start coming to church. Oh, I see. Uh, it, it's, it's difficult. That's a good question. Um, I mean, me personally, I didn't want to go at all. <laughs> Despite everything that people used to say. My mom would say, you're going to hell. I'd be like, all right, see you there. <laughs> <laughs> see you there. <laughs> I used to be horrible. I'm telling you, I was a horrible kid, man. Um, but... I think the, if, if I were to approach um, a non-believer and tell them to come to church, I, I, I would introduce along with the, with the message of coming to church, the invitation to come to church with the gospel. Uh, I think that's the best way, in my opinion, to, to talk about Christ um, and also sort of invite them to church. You talk about Christ, you talk about the work that he's done on the cross, the resurrection, what the, what the cross actually means, um, that we have uh, now reconciliation back with God because of our, like Lorena said, that, that sin entered the world. So there was that break, that separation from God. But now through Christ, we have that, that unison that we, that we can uh, look forward to after the past life. Um, I would talk about that and then also say, hey, if you want to learn more about this, this type of message, the implications of it, the applications of it, come to church. You know, we have the worship. Um, we have a pastor that, that speaks tremendously well. Um, I'm saying that in the, in, the, in the context of our church, right? Because um, I'm assuming we're going to bring it to this church. So we have our pastor who, who preaches really well. We have Matt who preaches really well. So bring them along. They're going to be blessed. No, you're good, bro. <laughs> they will be blessed. So I would introduce it like that because other, other times um, I see a lot of this sort of mistake. In my opinion, it's a mistake where you put off telling someone about the gospel and rely on the church to do it. You are the church, though. So you should be also communicating the message. Um, you don't have to, like, slam the person down and say, you're going to hell if you don't come to Sunday service. <laughs> um, so just talk about the gospel. Explain it. And Just look. yesterday, my dad was having a conversation with his manager. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if he knows the Lord. But I heard that he was in a car. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, like, I always think about how do we tell a non-Christian about Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, it's awkward to start the conversation or to transition any conversation into that. But it really just, it will throw him off so much mm -hmm. that you, you kind of, you have to answer. Yeah. Imagine, you're just having a conversation with a friend, and then all of a sudden you just turn to him and you go, um, do you know Jesus? By the way, do you know Jesus? Yeah. You know what I mean? He, you mean Jesus? The way they, <laughs> <laughs> no, like, do you know Jesus? You know, it, it would just be so awkward. <laughs> and he's going to have to give you an answer. Yeah. You, know, it, you just break the ice right away and yeah. ask him, hey, do you know Jesus? And a person going to be like, what, what do you mean? I'm like, do you yeah. know Jesus? And the person can say, yeah, I've been, to, I've, been to, I've been to church before or I've heard about him. But then you ask the question, do you know him? Yeah. Not do you know about him. Now have you heard of his name? We all have. We live in America. If you have a cell phone, you've been exposed to the name of Jesus. But ask, do you know him? Because you have an answer that a person has, and you have an argument that a person has never heard of before. That Jesus is a person to be known. It's not a, a religion to follow. It's someone to get to meet. Just like you would ask someone, hey, do you know Mel? Do you know Lorena? Do you know Lucas? Do you know Jesus? And that's going to break so many barriers because the person's going to be like, maybe the person has the idea that God is out there somewhere and we are down here. 
And Jesus came to break that. Like, no, we can get to know each other. We can walk with each other. We can go through highs and lows. We can go through dark moments and light moments together. A um, couple more questions. This is also from last week. Uh, Lo, you can answer. I'll give you this one. But Lucas, feel free. We'll jump into. Yep. When I was younger, I was exposed to porn, and it has affected me till today. How do I stop coming back to it, and will God forgive me? So I was exposed, and it has affected me till today. How do I stop coming back to it, and will God forgive me? First thing I'm going to answer, God will always forgive you. It does not matter how far you've gone. It does not matter what you have done, because we have that kind of God, the kind of Jesus that gave up life to make sure that you are always covered. Does that mean you should do things on purpose because you know you're always covered? No, not at all. Mm -hmm. But know that you are always coated in the blood of Jesus, and that is ultimate forgiveness. With that said, part of our mission as Christians is to run far, far away from sin. Run as far away from it as the east is from the west. And part of that means having accountability but not just with yourself. It means from another person. With things like porn especially, um, I think those, those things that happen in the darkness are the hardest ones to overcome. And it's not just porn that happens in the darkness. Anxiety and depression can happen in the darkness. There are a list of things that we want to overcome that happen in our dark, quiet, alone spaces. Exposing that to light is what gets us to move past it. Find someone older and wiser than you. I will advocate for this as long as I live. Find someone older and wiser than you to be a mentor, to be an accountability partner, to be someone who can give you encouragement, but also call you out on things that you know you're not supposed to be doing. The first step you've already accomplished, which is knowing what you're doing is wrong. Mm -hmm. That's a very hard first step. And you've done it. I'm proud of you but also make sure that you find someone in your life that you can be honest with, that you can say, yeah, I watched something today I wasn't supposed to, or I did something or said something today that I shouldn't have. Can you help me not let that happen again? Put, put some, there's some security stuff that you can put on your phone. I have it to this day. Like I can't look up some, even some Google. Like generally, if it has the word adult in it, yeah. it will lock my phone. Right? To this day, I have that on my phone. Matt, you're that weak. No, I'm that protected. Right? It's just, it's perspective. I'm like, no, I want to make sure that it's not there. You know, there's some stuff that I need my wife to get on her phone. I'm like, hey, can you look up this article for me? Because it has the word adult in it. And I can't read it. Or I have to go to my laptop. But not on my phone. It's locked. It's there. Um, there are some people you have to unfollow. Unfollow them. There are some places you need to stop going to. Stop going to them. Okay, but you have to, I, I love what you said, you have to find someone. You cannot fight this battle alone. Mm -hmm. Cannot fight this battle alone. I think one of the biggest lies of pornography is that we don't think it's that bad. It's an addiction. And I think it's even worse than some drug addictions because the drug addiction, if you take heroin, for example, will start to affect your health and everybody notices right away. Porn doesn't affect your health like that. Mm -hmm. It takes longer. But it's taking a hold of your brain, and it's also changing your health. And you don't, you're not even aware of it, but it's already affecting you so much. Find a friend. Open up to someone. Listen to me. If you don't open up, it's not going to work. You cannot do this on your own. You cannot do it. You cannot do it. So I love what you said. Find, some, find a mentor. Um, another question. Lucas, I'll go to this one for you. I go to you for this one. I hate myself and the way I look. And every time I think about it, I think how I hate God's creation and how he's disappointed in me. How do I start loving myself? Wow. Um, we just want to say I, I, we feel with you here, honestly. Don't think you're alone. Thank you so much for saying this. Really appreciate it. I, I've, all, I've had the hardest time loving what I look like Same. throughout my, up to, I don't even know, 
19. So almost my entire teenage year, I hated what I looked like. I, I would never wear a T-shirt, like a, a, a short sleeve shirt. Because of how skinny I was, I remember yep. having friends like holding on to my wrist yep. and be like, "Look at how skinny you are." Oh my God, you too. You too. Yeah. I hated that. Still to this day. To this day. Oh, please! I'm almost thirty, and you can <laughs> still, still do it. Yeah. And there's a part of you uh, you have to, like you mentioned, you need to start changing how you think, mm -hmm. right? So what that most people don't like what you look like. God created me this way. And he's got promises for me. And one day, a Rachel will come around and be like, this is my man. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> this is the one I want. Who cares about the rest of the world? You've got your one girl who likes you. And that's it. I don't need anything else. I love how you use me as an example. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> use me as an example. <laughs> Praise the Lord for a girl like Natalie who yeah. looked at this twig and was like, I want him. <laughs> I like him. Oh, man. Yeah. Okay, I need to say something. Please boys, do, Lou. Please do. Forget the boys for a second. I want to speak specifically to the young women in this room. And I want you to look me in the eyes as best as you can because there's a lot of you. And I want you to hear me when I tell you this. You are perfect the way you are. Not because some man is going to come in your life and say, that's my girl. No, forget that for a second. You are perfect because you are you. You are perfect because you exist. Because God, a very perfect God, looked at a world of gorgeous sunsets and beautiful mountain ranges of perfect oceans and said, no, I need one of her too. You are perfect because you breathe in and out every day, because you try your best every day, and because God has already said that you are perfect the way you are. You are perfect because you are made beautifully and wonderfully and fearlessly. You are perfect just the way you are because you're you. Young women, forget about the models and forget about the twigs and forget about the girls who are curvier than you. Forget that for a second. And I want you to look at your hands and say, wow, these hands work great. And wow, my tummy processes my food and gives me nutrition. And wow, these legs carry me every day. Mm -hmm. And this mind thinks every day and eyes that see beautiful things every day. You have an amazing body that does amazing things. If I could even begin to describe, I'm a science major if you didn't know, if I could be even begin to get into the amount of amazing things that your body does just to keep you alive, every second, then it doesn't even matter what it looks like. Because God keeps that thing going every day because he knows he needs one of you here. He needs one of you and you and you and you here, now. Think of every gorgeous, perfect thing that you've ever seen and been madly enchanted by. Think of every amazing thing that you have just been in wonder and in awe of. God feels that way when he sees you. God feels awe and wonder when he looks at you. That same kind of awe and wonder that you feel when you see a cute little baby that just looks so perfect, when you see an animal that's just so adorable, that awe and wonder you feel, God feels that a million times more over you. Believe me when I say I know what it is like to look at yourself and not see anything you like. But I want to challenge especially the girls. But guys, feel free to do this too. Every day this week, I want you to pick one physical thing you like about yourself. It can be anything. I like the shape of my eyebrows today. I like how my hair is less fluffy today. 
I like that my feet look really cute in these shoes today. Find anything. And I want you to do that as long as you can. Find a friend to send a text to. Today, I really like the curl pattern of my hair. And keep that going. Remind yourself of the little things that are already so perfect. It's okay to change a few things here and there. I cut my hair more times a year than I probably should. Because I, I get bored. Kidding, you won't. <laughs> I will not. I don't care. I never want. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> you guys, are beautiful. Amen. 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 <laughs> amen. Can you guys put your hands together to them? Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys so much. God bless you. Have a great week. We have some of the questions here. We don't have time for them. We will start next week with the questions from today. Thank you so much. And Before Luigi, you guys leave, um, if you guys need.